So please, uh, while even if the literature remains unclear on the effectiveness of macular peeling in diabetic patients, you confirm the EVRS study results obtained in 2012. Please explain us your vision of epiretinal membrane peeling. Okay, uh, let me first um, demonstrate my technique and then I will compare my results uh, with the EVRS. I don't need now to re-emphasize again on the uh, importance of the vitreomacular interface as the uh, starting point uh, for the pathology, the pathological changes that happened, and the starting point for the reversal of that pathology and the re uh, healing mechanism uh, in the macula. Uh, well, there is nothing special about my technique uh, except that it, is, uh, it employs the chandelier uh, as the only illumination tool. Uh, I use a contact lens, of course, and uh, it provides the, uh, a super view uh, of the macula, but uh, the um, characteristic uh, part of the technique is the chandelier. And I usually like to uh, insert uh, my chandelier in the inferior uh, half of the globe, uh, because this helps me to work with my uh, forceps uh, through the superior trochas and cannula, with more uh, versatility than normal. And um, the main target uh, of the chandelier is uh, to free my second hand. Uh, we all work with one hand, and we have the other hand employed in holding the fiber optic uh, light pipe. When I have my second hand free, I can use it at least as a stabilizing factor for the working hand, or uh, in by manual uh, procedure. This was actually uh, first demonstrated by Didier de Corneau in 2012, uh, the idea of self-stabilization, and I liked that idea so much. But the difference was uh, that he uses that in a slit lamp uh, microscope uh, view. Uh, I don't have that, and so I started to look for an alternative that provides me the illumination uh, from another source, and it was the chandelier. Uh, so, um, there is uh, nothing special about the technique because uh, uh, concerning the stain injection and the peeling mechanism, but we need to emphasize something in the nature of the membrane that uh, helps me, uh, uh, that makes me more cautious in the peeling. The membrane is thicker, as demonstrated by Agnieszka. Uh, the underlying macula is ischemic, emphasized by Schengel as well. And uh, so, uh, you are. Uh, uh, peeling in an unusual situation because uh, bleeding is inevitable during the peeling. Iatrogenic breaks are common. You need to perform your peeling in a slower fashion than normal, a cautious fashion than normal. Of course, this doesn't apply to the simple, straightforward cases of diabetic macular edema. This applies more to more sophisticated cases, like the cases which are uh, which have recurrent membranes after diabetic vitrectomy, for example, mm -hmm. or cases with uh, severe advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where you have the real barriers uh, through your course. Um, well, let's move. Uh, sometimes you have some intrinsic barrier in the macula itself when you have a large foveal cyst, like in this case. You need to peel and uh, to finish up the, uh, the membrane removal without the roofing of the cyst, the roofing of the cyst may uh, limit uh, much your prognosis uh, after the peeling. And so in these cases, I uh, like to uh, surround the area of the uh, foveal cysts with uh, what you can call a temporary inverted ILM flap intraoperative flap, just a flap, you try to gather the membranes and the ILM uh, around the area so that they are connected just to the summit of the foveal cysts. Um, and once you are done with that and you have the connection in uh, just one uh, point, which is the top, you can tangentially perform a slow. This slow speed of peeling can never to my mind and to my capabilities, uh, be achieved except you have something to stabilize your working hand. Because if you work with just one hand without stabilization, you would have just the tendency to go fast to finish the peeling in a rapid way. This slow motion, and this is not edited, this is the, uh, the way it was done, 
can only be done by uh, this way. Well, uh, this is a more difficult uh, membrane, which is a recurrent membrane after a vitrectomy. Here, during the peeling, I'm afraid at each and every point of vitreo uh, uh, of vascular epicenters to bleed. And you see that I peel and I stop to observe. And when I feel that I'm closer to a point of uh, a root, a vascular epicenter, I just uh, uh, peel slowly and well, if it passes without hemorrhage, it's not okay. I'm lucky, but if at a point it bleeds, I will have to stop. And I think uh, this will happen now. Uh, some bleeding will happen at this stage, at the next uh, point of connection, yes. Mm -hmm. And I had to stop. You know the film. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know the film. <laughs> and I had to stop. So peeling and stopping, I think this um, slow, motion needs uh, some stabilizer. This is, uh, to my mind, one of the most difficult membranes uh, because it was uh, a recurrent, uh, thick, uh, the underlying macula fairly ischemic. I had to uh, do it by manually and uh, under heavy liquid, perfluorocarbon liquid, because I was quite sure that with the minimal pull with the forceps, or the, I, will, I may have the retina detached completely with me, and so I had to do that with extreme caution, and maybe if I see a case like this, I wouldn't go again for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I used in this situation a, a pick that was fashioned from an inner, a needle, just a needle, and you bend the tip of the needle. But again, there's no need for industry in that, just a needle. And um, uh, peeling went on as uh, supposedly fine. However, the visual outcome in this case wasn't, of course, uh, uh, nice, or as, uh, as we regard. Sometimes we may have uh, just a point of connection, uh, not a flat membrane, and in this case, why not to use a bimanual approach also in this situation? Because one point of connection may uh, result in a disaster if you undermine this uh, during the tackling of this uh, difficult membrane. Um, uh, you see here, the connection is uh, immediately at the fovea, and uh, I have to tackle this with a great deal of uh, uh, caution and, um, and in the same time, meticulous removal. So, um, the EVRS study showed that the past plan of vitrectomy and island peeling yields far more better, much better results than the other uh, modalities. And in my series, I, uh, I retrospectively uh, reviewed uh, 68 cases of uh, tractional macular edema, um, uh, for which I did my technique. And when you see my uh, results, in the vision improved and followed the same course as the EVRS, except in the, that there was a boost in the initial six months. And I explained that, that uh, the relief of frank traction, traction, frank tissue level, not cell level traction, that was relieved during uh, the vitrectomy itself uh, made the pace of the improvement uh, maybe more rapid in the beginning without a much plateau. But it continued rising in a steady fashion to almost five lines of vision of improvement at 18 months, which is the same as what happened in the uh, EVRS study. Uh, again, also in the macular thickness, you see that uh, there is um, a significant um, a decrease in the uh, reduction in the thickness in the first uh, six months. And of course, again, I attribute that to the relief of traction in itself as a factor in addition to the normal healing mechanism that was incited inside the uh, macula. And uh, uh, to that also, there has been um, a significant, uh, a positive, strong positive correlation, uh, negative, sorry, correlation between the vision and the macular thickness. But there is a strong correlation, and, and this is all proved by the traction. Uh, but there are exceptions. You may find, for example, in this case, the same patient, uh, but she had uh, a significant anatomical improvement in both eyes, but the visual improvement is not. And that's why the visual factor in these cases may not sometimes be uh, 
uh, the only reliable factor. We need more to go to the anatomy because if you imp have improvement, a significant improvement in the anatomy, that's uh, uh, okay. Uh, forget about this case, it's not important. So at the end, I would like to emphasize the results of the EVRS, and when there are frank traction membranes, even the outcome will be better and more rapid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well. Frédéric, you found with data that combining intravitreal injection of anti-VGF with a subtenonian injection of steroids slowers the recurrence of macular edema in AMD. Please show us your results. Okay. Um, hello. I'm not here to fight against IVTs, but against too much IVTs, multiple IVTs. Today, once again, I speak about use of corticosteroid septenum combined with anti-VHF IVT. Recurrence in exudative AMD is, of course, the main problem with this chronic disease. This is why, seven years ago, we began to try association of anti-VHF IVT and septenum corticosteroids. Purpose was to treat difficult and very different cases of CNV for AMD. But time has changed. Now we have three products, Avastin, Lucentis, and Elia, and switches are common. And now it's time for feedback for this combined treatment. So does it have no interest? What means nowadays an IVT protocol for AMD? Forget the patient, just see OCT, second check the disease if okay for an IVT, then start a protocol with multiple IVTs. Clearly a bad medical reflection. Wet OCT bad, dry good. Duality for the dumps. No semiological approach, no real individual treatment. No matter if CNV is occult or classic, just inject and inject a lot. Both protocols and the guideline with OCT give false sense of security. Inject, inject a lot. Other treatments become usual and potentially linked with immediate and repetitive money profit. But this money in protocol is tempting and politically correct. What means politically correct for IVT in AMD treatment? In fact, all CNV must have first line three IVTs for treatment. If CNV recurrence, do another IVT. And if reluctant, do a lot of IVTs or switch, but still a lot of IVTs. But could we do not so much IVTs? A lot of question. Why first line free IVTs for all CNVs, especially if occult? What about risk of atrophy or visual acuity decrease if macular edema or subretinal fluid disappears? What about patient with occult CNV and visual acuity increase with delay without doing another IVT? and side effects of multiple IVTs such as tachyphylaxis or perhaps plenty of consequences we do not yet know. And what about associate treatments and trying to find a minimal number of IVTs useful for each patient? Don't you think that less IVT is not possible for majority of occult, which has a majority of CNVs? See next our experience with corticoids for that. To manage lucentis tachyphylaxis or difficult CNV cases or to manage ILEA resistance, we use combined anti-VGF IVT with corticoid subtenin before switching or switching back for another anti-VGF. Both IVT and subtenin were done at the same time, one step. Goal was to decrease number of IVTs required. Our experience is no more than 1,000 eyes, long follow-up, around seven years, and same results observed. We began with triamcinolone for the corticoid subtenin, but from July 2010, we switched from triamcinolone to bethabetasone because of intraocular oppression issues with triamcinolone. Anyway, this is a cheap and effective combined treatment. With it, we succeeded to increase the interval needed for two re-injections. In fact, about 70% had more than three months required for two combined treatment. Mean delay was about five months and similar result for both betamethasone and triamcinolone. For functional results with lucentis and betamethasone, 20% increased visual acuity more than two lines with Snellen visual acuity shots. 56% stabilized and 24 at visual equity decrease. With association lucentins and triamcilonone, results were a little bit less good, as you can see, 
even if number of stabilized eyes was the same. Our feedback with ILA is similar, but these patients were previous patients with visual acuity decrease with combined leucinitis, anti-VGF, and subtenone corticosteroids. That means all have had a first switch from leucinitis to combined leucinitis, IVT, and corticoids. So they had a long time history with AMD, and no patient was naive, of course. Our preliminary results with follow-up three years from 2013 show that switch cilia is successful for majority without need of corticoid association, but 70% develop resistance and no res or no response with ILEA alone. For these eyes, we try to combine IVT, ILEA, and subtenone of corticoids, majority at association with beta-metasome acetate. Mean delay between two combined injections was more than three months with beta metasome and about four months with triamcinolone. Visual acuity with Snellone visual acuity charts increased for about 13% for all cases, stabilized for around 70%. It decreased for 19% if beta metasome and 13% if triamcinolone. What that means? Of course, we need IVT, but I'm sure less than we use it. With this cheap combined treatment with corticoids, you could improve visual acuity and increase delay between two injections. It seems effective, perhaps because AMD with CNV is a multifactorial disease with an underestimated inflammatory part, and probably because we underestimate the effect of corticoid on CNV. To conclude, I don't know if you will try this combined treatment, but I'm sure you should. And if you don't, once again, try to keep the role of guardians of the temple. Keep medicine as an art. Don't trust protocol if it leads to automatic practice. Try different treatments because there are very different kinds of CNV, and I think a lot of it requires less IVT than we did. This is, of course, difficult to find a phase safe between under-treat and over-treat, but who could find it if you I think it's time too for searching small algorithms to help us finding best individual treatments and fear, all of you, enforceable protocol with big pharma inside. If it happens, you will be outside a medical role and I pray this won't happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed, you are true to say that we must reduce the number of injections. As you p perhaps know, I had uh, an endophthalmitis uh, during the last winter uh, following an IVT injection. And indeed, it is true that the more we inject, so more we get a risk of getting uh, endophthalmitis because we are disrupting this conjunctiva and leaving access to uh, bacteria. So definitely we need to be very careful with uh, IVTs and uh, to be sure that it is uh, necessary. Uh, on your side, Jean-Paul, you want to report one case of tractional retinal detachment related to a misdiagnosis that just received numerous injections. We are listening to you. Good morning. So, too, too often, to come on to start. Too often we have to deal with uh, too late surgery uh, related to, to many IVTs in a pathology where there is no indication for IVT. So, we have to perform surgery in a case with a huge macular edema, a loss of visual acuity, and uh, in this case, uh, posterior pole retinal detachment. So, is the answer to the question of that uh, our friend uh, asks. You, you have to uh, deal with the semiology and know if there is a huge macular edema, you will increase the sight even in this case with the posterior pole uh, retinal detachment. So let's go, to, let, let's go back to the UVRS macular edema study. And it's, uh, as you know, 500 and, uh, excuse me, 551 case and uh, 344 cases was uh, operated by ILM peeling, but that means that 35% was injected or uh, healing with uh, other treatment. So if you look at the result, the, the final, uh, final visual acuity improvement 
is higher with um, ILM peeling. So the ILM peeling seems to be the leading technique for this case. And uh, as you will see, you will have better result with visual acuity if you perform the surgery at the beginning. So when the level of the visual acuity is, is, is good, so it's uh, 0.8 or 0.6 in uh, uh, Snellen visual acuity. But the rate of improvement in Logmar line will be higher if you do uh, a low visual acuity. So the question is, uh, if you do a surgery on a man with count finger or uh, uh, 0.5, 0.05 or 1, you will have third line, four line, or up to 10 line of uh, Logmar improvement. So let's go to the long lasting quality. The only technique who bring you a long lasting quality after 24 months is the ILM peeling. So let's let have a look to the evolution of retinal sickness according to the treatment. And you can learn from this slide two things. The first one is that the leading um, treatment seems to be uh, IVT with anti-VEGF. But it's the first step to understand that with the ischemia side effect of the anti-VEGF, you will have uh, an improvement of the sickness of the macula, but you can have 200 micron sickness with the atrophia and uh, with a very low visual acuity. So this is the... Uh, a good slide to understand that we have to take care of uh, speaking about uh, sickness of the macula without speaking of Im improvement in visual acuity. The second thing is that when you uh, mixed two techniques, so with uh, intravitreal injection of triamcinolone, you will lower the, lower the result uh, compared to pure treatment. So the last case is um, Um, try to answer to the question of macular edema. Uh, this story is the story of a medical doctor with a membrane on both eyes, and she had several uh, IVT, 13 on one eye and 17 on the other. She's from the north part of France, and she came to see me. And so this, the ac visual acuity was count finger and uh, one uh, in Snellen uh, visual acuity on the um, other eye. So this is one of the surgery. And as you can see, the macular edema is very high. So I peel out the posterior hyaloid and the internal limiting membrane. And uh, the result was really good, probably because she was very young. But the macular edema decreased very quickly in 10 days. And the visual acuity come from 1 to 4. Uh, you will see the, the OCT, the post-op OCT on the, on the video. And the visual acuity and the sickness 10 days after the surgery. So it's just to say that uh, uh, the main indication for uh, ILM peeling is macular edema. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Frédéric.